Now, the first reading this morning is taken from Mark, chapter 6, verses 1 to 6. Jesus left there and went to his hometown, accompanied by his disciples. When the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were amazed. Where did this man get these things, they asked? What's this wisdom that has been given him? What are these remarkable miracles he is performing? Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son and the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? Aren't his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor, except in his own town, among his relatives and in his own home. He could not do any miracles there, except lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. He was amazed at their lack of faith. Thanks be to God for the reading of his word. Reading continues in Mark's gospel, chapter 6, and from verse 6 to 13. Then Jesus went around teaching from village to village, calling the 12 to him. He began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over impure spirits. These were his instructions. Take nothing for the journey except a staff. No bread, no bag, no money in your belts. Wear sandals, but do not take an extra shirt. Whenever you enter a house, stay there until you leave the town. And if any place will not welcome you or listen to you, leave that place and shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them. They went out and preached that people should repent. They drove out many demons and anointed with oil many who were ill and healed them. This is the word of the Lord. Well, friends, we get back to our series in Mark that we've been working on for a little while now. And we're in chapter six, uh, Meet the King, is the title I've given our series. And uh, we have done that, haven't we? We've been uh, meeting Jesus face to face. We've been shadowing him as he's walked around Galilee and Nazareth. And uh, he comes back to his hometown, Nazareth, uh, today. And we see what, how he's treated there. And I've entitled our sermon today, uh, The Missionary King. The missionary king. Well, what a time South Africa has been going through for the last uh, year or two. Well, actually, quite a bit longer than that, but especially the last year or two. Quite apart from COVID, which has been bad enough, the factionalism in the ANC is stronger than ever. Then there was the looting, and then there's been the eye watering revelations of the State uh, Commission of C Capture Commission, where corruption on an industrial scale. Has, uh, has come to light. Though our president has been praised for his calming influence, you have to ask, where is the moral leadership? Where is the spiritual and moral guidance that we need for our lives and our nation and indeed our whole world? Where is leadership that we can actually trust? A leadership that we know is good for us and good for our nation and that we're happy to submit to. Well, Robin reflected on this very question in his prayer this morning, didn't he? Well, Mark's gospel would tell us that in a broken world like this one that we live in, Jesus is the leader we've been looking for. Kind and compassionate, yet incorruptible and acting with extraordinary authority. You might remember the way Mark started this gospel, the very first line of this book, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus, the Christ, the Son of God. In other words, Jesus is God's choice of leader. Jesus is God's choice of king. He is the leader we all need in our daily personal lives, as well as for the public leadership of our nation and our world. But as we start reading through Mark's gospel, we've noticed that a strange thing happens. Although Jesus is a king without equal, opinions about him become more and more divided. So just a quick recap. After a brief introduction, we saw the arrival of Jesus, the king, in chapter one. But he was rejected by his people. That was chapter two. And then in chapter three, Jesus shows us who the new people 
of the king are going to be. Those who don't reject him, but do accept him. That's chapter three. Chapter four tells us that he will build his kingdom through the power of his word. And then chapter five, he demonstrates just how powerful his word is. And that actually his word is quite capable of creating a kingdom for him out of nothing. And that's where we pick up the story today. Here in chapter six, Jesus starts training his disciples and preparing them for life after he leaves them. And as he does so, we see people becoming increasingly polarized around Jesus. There are many who reject him, but still his kingdom grows and grows as others put their faith in him. And so today we're going to see how people respond to Jesus and how he responds to them. And so first of all, in those first six chapters, people wanted to domesticate Jesus. They wanted to tame him, to bring him down to becoming just one of them. Let me reread those verses to you. Jesus left there and went to his hometown, that's Nazareth, accompanied by his disciples. And of course, at this point in his ministry, Jesus is in full training mode. He's investing his time in these disciples. Verse 2, when the Sabbath came, that is Saturday, a church day for the Jews, Jesus began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were amazed. Where did this man get these things, they asked? What's the wisdom that's been given him? What are these remarkable miracles he is performing? Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son and the brother of James and jo Joseph and Judas and Simon? Aren't his sisters here with us as well? And they took offense at Jesus. Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor except in his own town, among his relatives, and in his ho own home. He could not do any miracles there except lay his hand on a few sick people and heal them. He was amazed at their lack of faith. So Jesus returns to his hometown, to Nazareth, and he heads to the synagogue and he starts teaching. And people are amazed at what they hear because he spoke as one who had an authority all of his own. We read that actually earlier in chapter one as well. People were amazed because he spoke with authority. Jesus was quite happy to say that all the prophets and writers of the Old Testament were actually talking about him, a lowly artisan the illegitimate son of a simple peasant girl from Nazareth. So people were shocked and astonished and amazed by the things he said, the audacity, maybe even the arrogance they would have thought. But then there were the miracles as well. And no one, not even his fiercest distractors, could deny that the miracles were real. The miracles added even more weight to his words. The miracles were object lessons. They were sermons in 3D, you might say. But the miracles never stood on their own. Jesus never performed a miracle in a vacuum. He added the miracles to his teaching to back up what he had been saying and to demonstrate in real life what he had been saying. If you take away Jesus's teaching, well, the miracles, when you think about it, just become confusing and ambiguous. It's actually difficult to work out what the miracle is meant to show you unless you have the teaching that goes with it. But add the miracles to the teaching and suddenly what Jesus says becomes absolutely clear and utterly compelling. And yet, as we, re as we read Mark's gospel, we find that the people were confused they understood what Jesus was saying. That wasn't the problem. Their problem was that they couldn't accept the things that Jesus was saying. In verse 2, they say, where does he get these things? Like, what is he thinking? Where does he get this stuff from? Doesn't he remember who he is? He's one of us. He's nothing special. He's just a carpenter, for goodness sake. It's a classic case of familiarity breeds contempt. Look at verse 3. Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son, the brother of James, Joseph, 
Judas and Simon, aren't his sisters here with us? They took offense at Jesus. You see, because they knew him so well, astonishment turns to suspicion, which then turns to resentment, and they take offense at Jesus. Jesus, you see, was a stunningly ordinary man. He would have made an excellent assassin, I was thinking about the other day. He simply didn't stand out from the crowd. He, did just, he was ordinary, ordinary. Nothing about his appearance, Isaiah tells us, would have caught your eye. So the people of his town couldn't accept that one of their own, someone so ordinary, was actually greater than they were. And they simply wouldn't accept instruction from him. Talk about tall poppy syndrome. Who does he think he is? Where does he get these crazy ideas from, they ask. Just imagine two ladies having their hair done in the salon in Nazareth. That Jesus is getting too big for his boots. Has he forgotten that I taught him in grade two? Well, never mind that, the other one says, I changed his nappies. And here he is walking around, claiming to be the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I'm sick of it. He's insulting our intelligence. And they took offense at him. In verse 2, we read that the crowd were amazed. But in verse 6, we read that Jesus was amazed. Jesus was amazed at their lack of faith, Mark records. He is simply astonished by their stupidity and their stubbornness. And he says in verse 4, a prophet is not without honor, except in his own town, among his own relatives, and in his own home. Isn't that astonishing what Jesus says? The truth is, though, that Jesus isn't just any old prophet. He is the prophet of God, the prophet promised in Deuteronomy, who would one day come and lead God's people, not just into the promised land, but into heaven. In fact, the truth is even more difficult to stomach than that. Jesus is much more than just the prophet. He's actually the God who sent the prophets to Israel in the Old Testament. That makes him the ultimate prophet, the one who is truly qualified to speak on God's behalf. Because now he's not just sending prophets, he is coming in person to speak with authority. Well, friends, you've got to be honest. That's difficult to believe. It's difficult to believe unless there's evidence to back up his claims. And friends, there is. The evidence is overwhelming if you bother to look at it. But the problem with the people in Nazareth is that they were blind to the evidence because of their familiarity to Jesus. Their familiarity had bred contempt, and they can't bear to consider the possibility that they need to bow and learn and even worship this Jesus. Because they knew about Jesus, they made the mistake of thinking that they knew Jesus. Now in verse 5, when it says he could not do any miracles there, that's not describing a limitation on Jesus' power. Jesus does not depend on us for anything. Our faith is not a prerequisite for him to be able to work. A few weeks ago, we saw how Jesus saved his disciples from drowning by calming the violent storm. He didn't do that because they believed. He did that despite their unbelief. Do you remember he said to them afterwards, do you still have no faith? Then when they get to land, Jesus casts demons out of a Gentile. That man had no faith in Jesus. He hadn't even heard of Jesus. Jesus does not need our faith to perform his miracles. If he doesn't answer our prayers in the way that we would like, that does not mean we didn't have enough faith. That's such an important point to make because churches are wrongly teaching that if you don't get your miracle, it's your fault because you didn't have enough faith. Friends, that is not the Bible. Let's be clear. That is false teaching. Miracles do not depend on our faith. You see, Jesus' power is unlimited. 
but people had already made up their minds about him. And so he won't waste his time on them anymore. That's what it means. This is the uncomfortable side of Jesus. We like to think that he's hovering, ar hovering around like a guardian angel, waiting to jump in and do whatever we ask of him. It's like having God on speed dial. But friends, that's the wrong way around. It's us who are on God's speed dial. We should be hanging around waiting to do whatever he asks of us. But these people of Nazareth had made up their minds. They had sat in judgment of Jesus, and they decided that he wasn't God. At best, he was deluded. At worst, he was a liar. But friends, no one sits in judgment of God. God will not be judged by us. So when Mark says he could not do any miracles there, he means that Jesus could not persuade them. Could not describes Jesus's choice, not Jesus's inability. Doing miracles wouldn't have changed their minds. Miracles would just have made their hearts harder. If they didn't believe the words of the prophets in the Old Testament, and they didn't believe Jesus's words, well, then no amount of miracles would have made an ounce of difference. As Jesus says in the parable of the rich man and Lazarus, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. Miracles don't produce faith. Preaching, the gospel, produces faith. So friends, be very careful how you treat Jesus' words. Do not ignore Jesus' words, either in the Old Testament or in the New Testament. Be very careful not to sit in judgment of him. Well, I think Jesus was just a good man. Well, I think Jesus was just a good teacher. Well, I think Jesus was just another prophet. I don't think Jesus intended for us to actually worship him. I think Jesus' ideas are outdated. I think Jesus was just a myth. And so the I thinks go on and on and on. You might just find that Jesus walks away and takes the remedy for your sin with him. You see, Jesus is the judge, not you and not me. As his creatures, we don't have the right to sit in judgment of our creator. He will not be judged by anyone. I love the sarcasm at the end of verse 5. I hope you picked it up there. Jesus could not do any miracles there, except he laid hands on a few sick people and healed them. <laughs> of course, he did miracles right there. It's sarcastic. It's like Mark is saying, these proud, arrogant people said Jesus was a nobody. And so he quietly emptied a hospital on the way out of town. <laughs> he left that town with the living proof that they had made a big mistake. There were all the healed people walking around them as testimony to who Jesus really was. So people wanted to domesticate Jesus, to tame him, to reduce him to just being one of them. And friends, if we're honest, we try and do the same thing all the time. In this country, at least, there are still many people who are happy to be respectful towards God. We're even happy to have Jesus make a guest appearance every Christmas, so long as he minds his own business and stays in the manger where, you, where he is utterly harmless. But start talking about Jesus as though he is actually the God who created you. And that you should be worshiping and serving him, well, suddenly everything changes. Suddenly, interestingly, tolerance and open-mindedness goes out the window. And you see what people really think about God. People wanted to domesticate Jesus in the first century. And people want to domesticate Jesus now. We don't want him to have any claims or make any demands on our lives so that we can carry on living the way we want to carry on living. So first, people wanted to domesticate Jesus, and we all still want to do that. But secondly, Jesus responds by delegating his authority to his apostles. He deputizes and then sends out the 12 apostles. Have a look again at verse 6. Then Jesus went around teaching from village to village. And calling the 12 to him, he began to send them out two by two, and gave them authority over impure spirits. 
So undeterred by the rejection that Jesus had experienced by his family and his hometown, Jesus goes on mission to the surrounding towns and villages. And now there's a new development in verse 7. The apostles have been with Jesus long enough, and it's time to kick them out of the nest. So he sends them out in pairs with his authority to multiply his ministry. Moses had said that you needed the testimony of at least two witnesses, hence going out in pairs. And notice three other instructions that he gives the apostles. Firstly, Jesus called them to trust him as they spread the gospel. Take nothing for the journey except a staff. No bread, no bag, and no money. Wear sandals, but don't take extra clothes, he says. In other words, Jesus made sure that they would be utterly dependent on the grace of God working through the generosity and the hospitality of his people. This instruction, of course, was specific for the apostles, but I think the principle still applies today. As a church, we can plan and budget all we like, but ultimately gospel ministry depends on the grace of God working through the generosity and the hospitality of his people. The apostles didn't wait until they had enough money in the bank before they went out. They weren't even allowed to take money with them. They went out and then God provided through his people as they went. This is hard to put in practice because it goes against the grain. In gospel ministry, we have to be completely reliant on God to provide. You may be sure that there will never be enough money at the start of a new outreach or at the start of a new ministry, or at the start of a new project. But just wait and watch and see what God will do as you step out in faith. Money follows after ministry. Money comes after ministry and not vice versa. If we put off ministry until money comes in, we will be waiting a very long time. Gospel ministry exposes us to risk financial, and even maybe physical risk. The bottom line is that God wants to see if we will trust him. We say we put our faith in him. Now, well, let's see that faith in action. And your role in the kingdom might not be to preach and teach and rely on hospitality. Your role might be to provide the hospitality and be the means that God uses to enable his gospel to spread. And that's an important point, isn't it? For the gospel to spread, two things need to happen. Someone has to be available to teach the Bible and explain how people can be forgiven. And someone has to be available to open their home and supply the material needs of the Bible teachers and the evangelists. Gospel ministry is a partnership where we all need to pull together and we all need to make ourselves and our resources available for God to use as he sees fit. So firstly, God calls us to trust him, both in providing our needs, but also to be, to be the needs, the means by which he provides for our needs. But secondly, Jesus calls them to be content as they spread the gospel. Whenever you enter a house, he says, stay there until you leave that town. In other words, stay in the first house that offers you hospitality. Accept the first offer of a home and stay there. Don't go looking around the village for better offers. Imagine the impression that would have made. The principle is that there is no career path in gospel ministry. Ministers shouldn't move from church to church to improve their creature comforts. We don't consider a call from another church on the basis of whether they throw in timeshare holidays or a company car. We consider a call from another church on the basis of our gifts and the specific gospel needs of that church. Jesus then warns them that spreading the gospel will bring judgment as well as salvation. He says, and if any place will not welcome you or listen to you, like Nazareth, leave that place and shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them. Oops. Sorry, I don't know what's happened here. There you go. 
Jesus is saying that as we go about this work of spreading the gospel, there is a high likelihood of rejection. And when people reject the preaching of the gospel, that same preaching will become God's judgment on them. When the Jews returned from visiting a foreign or a non-Jewish land, they would symbolically shake out the dust from their clothes, you know, make a big fuss as they crossed the border and dusted off their feet, a big fuss of showing that they rejected the paganism of the land that they had just come from, uh, and that they rejected those practices of those dirty people. Well, Jesus tells his disciples here to do something absolutely shocking. Don't miss it. He tells them to do something you would never do to another Jew. Shake the dust off your clothes when you walk out of their house. Can you see the impact? It was the ultimate insult. You were basically saying that your host was unclean, no better than a Gentile, and didn't even deserve to call themselves a Jew. It was a visual demonstration of God's judgment on that person and that house. Now, this isn't something we would do today, of course, because we are not apostles. But the message is very clear. If you reject the apostolic message that Jesus is the Lord, well, then you're inviting God's judgment on yourself and your home and your family. As Paul says in Corinthians, but thanks be to God who uses us to spread the aroma of the knowledge of Jesus everywhere. For we are to God the pleasing aroma of Christ among those who are being saved and those who are perishing. To the one, we are an aroma that brings death. To the other, we are an aroma that brings life. You see, when we share the gospel with our neighbor or that mom at the school gate, to one of them, it could be the best message they have ever heard. It will change their life completely. It will change their destiny completely. To them, the gospel smells sweet and beautiful, and you become the aroma of life to them, says Paul. But to the other, that same gospel will be insulting and offensive, and they will hate it, and to them it will, it will literally stink, says Paul, and you will become the aroma of death to them. The gospel saves and gives life to those who embrace it, and people will love you for telling them. But God also uses that same gospel to confirm his judgment on those who reject him, and they will hate you for telling them. Well, let me wrap up this morning. Oops, I missed out that slide, sorry. Let me wrap up. Jesus is a king with a mission. Maybe we should say he is the king on a mission. His plan is to create a kingdom for himself by sending out his followers to preach the gospel. Well, that's his plan. But is it a good plan? Have a look at verse 12 as we end. The 12 apostles went out and preached that people should repent. They drove out many demons and anointed many sick people with oil and healed them. Does that sound familiar? Does that ring any bells? Well, apart from anointing people with oil in order to heal them, the apostles are doing exactly what Jesus had been doing all along. By the way, Jesus never anointed anyone with oil, but he instructs the apostles to use oil. I think that's just a reminder to them uh, that if people are healed, it is Jesus doing the healing through them. It is not them who have suddenly got power in their fingers. But the result of Jesus' strategy, we read, is that his ministry multiplied. The apostles weren't only learning how to do Jesus's ministry, now they were actually doing Jesus's ministry. Jesus was literally working through them. There's a difference between them and us, of course. They were apostles and we are not, and that meant that they could do some of the miracles that Jesus did. But the principle is that Jesus can do mighty things through all of his people. He doesn't have to be physically present to build his kingdom. His power can be delegated and can be active through people who preach the message that he preached, that people everywhere should repent and change what they think about Jesus. 
and this includes us today. Though Jesus is physically in heaven at the moment, running the world and praying for us, nevertheless, his spirit, the Holy Spirit, is working through his people, continuing his ministry, changing people's lives and drawing them into his kingdom through the preaching of the gospel. That means that as I teach you the words of the Bible, I teach you with Jesus' authority delegated to me. And as you explain the words of the Bible to your friends, you are teaching them with Jesus' authority delegated to you. And that means that as you share the gospel, you can expect to watch God changing people's lives. And sadly, you can also expect some people to take offense as they continue in their rejection of Jesus as their king. So will you join our missionary king on mission? Boldly telling the world that God has made Jesus both Lord and King, even in the face of opposition. And will we trust him to provide the resources we need as we go about doing that? And will we make ourselves available to be the resources that God uses to enable others to spread the gospel? Well, won't you bow with me and pray? Well, Father, we thank you for this gospel message that brings life and uh, results in forgiveness and salvation and adoption and redemption. What a precious message, um, a treasure. Uh, and you have entrusted it to people like us, jars of clay, fragile, cracked, frail. Uh, and Lord, give us the power and the strength and the resources we need and the boldness to take this precious, precious message that offers salvation out into the world as people bow the knee to their King, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.